Pokemon Sword is a game that I've only ever played once, so I figured it would be fun to revisit the 8th generation and see if I can beat a Pokemon Sword Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Dark types. The standard Nuzlocke rules include that any Pokemon that faints must be permanently boxed and you can only catch the very first Pokemon you find in any area. And in this case, we only get to catch the first Dark type we find in an area. And as for the Hardcore rules, Battle Mode must be played on Set Mode, no items can be used in battle except for held items, and you're not allowed to overlevel the next gym leader highest level Pokemon before entering the battle. We'll also be adding the additional rule that we're not allowed to Dynamax, which I may come to regret down the line. Anyway, here are the dark type encounters we can get in Pokemon Sword and Shield, and as you can see, we got a pretty awesome roster to choose from. And with the Isle of Armor DLC, we also have access to Sharpedo and Zoroark. However, since I'm playing Sword, we don't get access to the Shield exclusive Pokemon Mandiba, Sableye, and Tyranitar. And with all that out of the way, we can start our adventure. Ah yes, the Galar region, inspired by the marvelous Great Britain. Now hold on a minute, that hat makes me look like an absolute felon! And speaking of people looking weird, here's our champion Leon, who dresses the way I would have liked to when I was seven. I'm with this guy in the crowd, like what are you wearing, Leon? Anyway, Leon's not that bad though, because he lets us choose our starter Pokemon, none of which is going to turn into a dark type, so I just make the most base decision. We can then go to Route 1 and find our real first encounter, a Nicket. I capture and name her Bristol, and it turns out she has a brave nature, which is plus attack minus speed. And after acquiring some new hipster drip in Wedgehurst, we can move on to Route 2, where we find our second encounter, a C Dot. Now, C Dot isn't a dark type until it evolves into Nuzleaf, so we're gonna have to bench it on the team for now, and it ends up having a quiet nature, which is plus special attack and minus speed, so pretty garbo. And it's at this point we have to take on our first somewhat difficult battle against Hop, and it's not looking good. Nicket is a Pokemon that has a base of 28 in both attack and defense. To put that into perspective, everybody makes fun of Onyx for being garbage, and it has 45 attack. So this being the case, I'm obviously pretty worried for this battle, but at least I have the move Hone Claws to increase my attack power a bit. And I decide to go for three Hone Claws, which is pretty risky since Hop has three Pokemon at this point. On top of that, he's not exactly making it easy for me by using Growl to lower my attack back down, but two quick attacks at least takes care of the Wooloo. Next up is his Sobble, and as I go for a quick attack, I find out that it's going to take three hits to take him out. Now luckily for me, Hop wants to show off his new move Water Gun, which is great since my special defense is a lot better than my defense. However, I'm getting to be at very low health, and he goes for Growl the next turn, which means Quick Attack turns into a 4-hit KO. And while Sobble throws by going for Growl and taking me down to my neutral attack stat, I still have to contend with Rookity in the back. So now that I'm sitting at 9 health, I've pretty much accepted defeat and that I'm gonna have to do the run all over again. And after I see that I actually do fairly decent damage with Quick Attack, he takes me down to 5 HP with a peck. And the next turn, Rookity goes for Leer, which means that another peck is gonna take me down. So with a heavy heart, I hit the resub- Hold on a minute, did Rookity just throw? I guess I just won the first battle against Hop! I thought I was gonna have to try this battle closer to the level cap, but we pulled through, and this means that Hop and I are going to the wild area. Now in the wild area, I treat every sub area as its own section where we can catch a new Pokemon. And so this means we can get our second usable team member, a Purloin that I named Norwich. He ends up having a hasty nature, which is actually okay for Purloin. I also run into a Pancham, which I catch and name Nottingham and put on the sidelines until he evolves into a dark type. Over in one of the corners of the wild area, we can find one of the most useful items, the leftovers. And after a bit of searching, we find Stunky, which is going to be so important because of its poison type. Poison resists fighting, which we're otherwise very weak to. So I name Stunky Liverpool and move on to Modestoke. Here we can upgrade our wardrobe a little bit and receive the Miracle Seed from Leon so that we can boost CDOT's power. We're also very rudely interrupted by Hop as we try to approach Ball Guy. You don't disrespect my guy like that. We also have to join the gym challenge, and with that, choose our trainer number. Nice. Now, the great thing about Sword and Shield is that we have so many encounters before the first gym, and so on my way to Turfield, I catch myself a Zigzagoon that I named Chester, and then I head over to the Isle of Armor where I run into a Corefish that I named Derby. And while catching Derby, CDOT reaches level 14 through the experience share, so we now have Nuzleaf on the team. Say hello to Leeds. And speaking of Nuzleaf, I find a Leech Stone in the Isle of Armor, which I decide to hold off on using for a while. I also end up running into Gloucester the NK and Glasgow the Ponyard. And right before taking on the first gym, we run into the annoying trainer Bead, and his psychic types go down just the way you'd expect them to. Maybe you should have used fairy types instead, dog. I also remember to pick up the expert belt outside the fighting dojo, and now it's finally time to take on our first gym challenge. For this one, I decide to lead with Glasgow, and I have one simple strategy, expert belt fury cutter. If you didn't know, fury cutter is a bug type move that powers up every time you use it consecutively. The catch is that its accuracy is kind of iffy. Now, this is only the first gym, but we get to see the Dynamax phenomenon, which I way underestimated for this challenge. 
Luckily for us though, Steel resists Grass, and we can go for a Fury Cutter that doesn't quite take out Eldegoss. The next turn we're introduced to Dynamax moves, and luckily for me this time we're eased into it, and I don't take that much damage from Max Overgrowth, and I can take out Eldegoss with our next Fury Cutter to gain the first Gym Badge. Milo never actually stood a chance against Ponyard, and after the Gym Battle, Chester evolves into Galarian Linoon. And at this point, this actually ends up being a huge power-up boost for the team. And we're gonna need that power-up boost, because very shortly after facing Milo, we're gonna have to go up against the water-type gym leader, Nessa. And I mean, just look at this girl. She's got inner tubes on her sneakers. I do indeed like women with ample flotation devices. Anyway, Nessa starts off the battle by sending in her Goldeen, and so this is Lead's time to shine. And after a fake out and a razor leaf, her Goldeen is ancient history. Her second Pokemon is Aracuda, which is really fast and ends up getting a flinch on the first turn, but her second bite isn't as lucky, and it too goes down to a razor leaf. It's then finally time for Nessa's ace Pokemon, Dynamax Dreadnaw. Now, I really don't want to switch anything into Dynamax moves from this thing, so I decide to stay in for one turn and hopefully live a max strike, and I actually do on very low HP in the red. I end up doing a substantial amount of damage with Razor Leaf, but the next turn we have to switch out. So I send in my tankiest Pokemon at the moment, which ends up being Chester, who actually tanks the max strike pretty well. Now, another one is going to knock us out, but luckily before the battle, I equip Chester with a Citrus Berry, which heals up just enough so that we can take another max strike. And after doing just that and tanking another max strike, the next turn, I retaliate with pretty pitiful damage with a Night Slash. At this point, at least Dreadnought's Dynamax turns are over, but both my speed and health are pretty low, so I decide to switch out into Liverpool. I wouldn't exactly say that I take a Razor Shell well, but at least after Citrus Berry, I'm at a point where I'm pretty comfortable taking another one. Luckily for me, however, I get a clutch Razor Shell miss, and I can go for a Screech. And I'm very glad that I was so confident in staying in because I live on 2 HP and I can retaliate with a bite which takes down Dreadnought and we get our second gym badge. And let me tell you, Dynamax only gets more and more problematic from here on out. Next up, we move on to Galar Mine number two, where I find myself a Scraggy. I name it Manchester, and it ends up having the ability Moxie. Now that's a sound catch, I'm buzzing about it. We also run into Bede, who gets very offended by my Manchester impression. Sorry, Bede. We then run into Team Yell once again, and after beating them, Nicket actually evolves into Thievil. And now that we have our second gym badge, we can actually catch some higher level Pokemon in the wild area, and I run into a Skaroopy. I name it Plymouth, and move on to the Isle of Armor, where I can fish for a Carvana. I name it Wakefield, and move on to the desert, where we can find another Isle of Armor encounter, Sand Isle. I name it Exeter, and much like Scraggy, it has the Moxie ability, which might come in handy. And to prepare for the gym challenge, I search around in the wild area if there are any good TRs on sale, and I find this guy who sells me Earthquake, which I can teach to Exeter. In preparation for the gym, we manage to get Norwich to evolve into Lipard, and then it's time to take on Kabu. Now this is the part of the game where the difficulty starts to really ramp up. He leaves off with Ninetales, so I decide to go into Exeter, and he tries to go for a Will-O-Wisp, but luckily I remember to give Sand out a Rostberry, so we heal off the burn and fire off an Earthquake, which isn't quite enough to get the KO. Now at this point, unfortunately, we've burned our Rostberry, so the next turn I do get burned and have my attack halved, but at least I can get rid of Ninetales with an Earthquake. This means I get a Moxie boost, which doesn't amount to anything in the end, since he sends in Arcanine, which intimidates me immediately. I figure I can tank one Flame Wheel, but it does a lot of damage, and we barely touch Arcanine with Earthquake. I decide Chester's my best switch in, but unfortunately, I get burned right away on the first flame wheel. This means I have to consume my Rossberry one turn earlier than I expected, and I'm not going to get to fire off two Night Slashes unburned. My second Night Slash even ends up being a crit, but it lives on red HP and goes for agility. That agility ends up being pretty clutch, though, since I can live another Flame Wheel and take out the Arcanine with a Night Slash, leaving only Scorch. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Gigantamax Scorch was the beginning of the end for me. See, I had this great plan. I was going to use Protect to stall out Gigantamax turns and maybe not lose too many Pokemon, but unfortunately, Chester goes down to the first move. You live on in the Queen's heart, Chester. Next up, I send in Inkay, which I thought I taught Protect, which probably wouldn't have mattered anyway, since it's quad weak to bug, but that's it for Inkay. My final attempt to stall out the Scent to Scorch is Liverpool, and fortunately, I actually taught it Protect. However, Sentascorch's G-Max Fire move actually traps me in Fire Spin, which means I'm not going to be able to switch out later. And even though Liverpool manages to pull off a Toxic and stall a little bit by using Protect, it ends up going down to a Flame Wheel. Liverpool, more like Deadpool. And so after losing half my team, I have to send in Scraggy, who can stall a little bit using Protect, tank a Flame Wheel, and then win us the battle by using Headbutt. And I mean, yeah, we won, but at what cost? Immediately after the battle, I decide to numb the pain by fetching some new drip. I also decide it's time to evolve Nuzleaf into Shiftry since our team kinda needs an upgrade after that great loss. 
Oh, and I also visit the person who means most to me, Ball Guy. I then have a very close call with a Team Yell Grunt where I almost lose Scraggy, but fortunately we pull through and after the battle, Exeter finally evolves into Crocorock. I'm then finally in Stoan's side, which I gotta say is the weirdest name for a city in this game. Fortunately for me though, I can head to Glimwood Tangle before the gym and run into an Impidim. I name him Bradford, and unfortunately for me, Bradford has a bold nature, which is minus attack. And to prepare for what I expect is gonna be one of the most difficult battles in my Nuzlocke career, I evolve my Pancham into Pangoro, Carvana into Sharpedo, and Impidimp into Morgrem. This means it's time to take on B and her fighting types, which are obviously super dangerous against our dark types. I lead with Nottingham and boost my attack by using Workup as Hitmontop fails to use a counter. After using my second Workup, Hitmontop hits me with a really strong revenge, but at least Citrus Berry gets me up above half health. At this point, I'm sitting on plus two attack from the Workup, so I'm feeling pretty confident that a single low sweep is going to take out Hitmontop. Beast Pangoro suffers the same fate, and then she sends in Surfetched, which doesn't actually get knocked out, but it goes for Swords Dance, so I get a free KO the next turn. Now I know what you might be thinking, hey, this gym battle's going very, very well against the fighting types, and uh, how could it go wrong from this point? Well, Dynamax Machamp had different plans for the way this battle was gonna turn out. I go for Protect with Nottingham, which actually lets me live a G-Max Cheese Strike. When you say it fast like that, it actually sounds like Cheese Strike. The second G-Max turn, I go for a Low Sweep, which actually takes Machamp under half health, but then Pangoro has to go down to a G-Max Cheese Strike. I then send in Thievul, who can burn the third G-Max turn by using Protect, and I actually live a Cheese Strike pretty well. But my success with Thievul isn't long-lived, it goes down to a Revenge the very next turn. Now here's my biggest mistake, I should have put the Sticky Barb on Thievul, that way I wouldn't have had to sacrifice Lipard too, but when Lipard goes down to Machamp, it means that the Sticky Barb is transferred, and Machamp is now taking damage every single turn. This makes the rest of the battle super easy, because I can just fake out to burn one turn, and the second turn I take it out by just using Protect. So at this point, that means we actually have six deaths, a full team of Pokemon, and if this is the way it's gonna go, we're not gonna be able to sustain these raids for very long. Next, we have to go look at these murals, which Beat is trying to tear down, which I totally understand, because it looks like a seven-year-old painted it. Leon, was that you? So after we defeat Beat, the chairman's facial expression pretty much sums up how I feel about this game's whole storyline. And after we arrive in Belonlia, we can pick up the super useful item, the Aviolite, or as you guys in the comments insist, Eviolite. Yeah, I feel kind of eviolated by your harsh criticisms of my pronunciation. Then as we're fighting the gym, we have to answer some- what? What? And just before facing the gym leader, Corfish evolves into Crawdon. Now the next gym fight is Opal and her fairy types, and this may sound very difficult on paper, but I had a sound strategy. The first turn I use Protect just to burn off a turn so that I get to Opal's question. And since we know she's called the Wizard, she doubles our speed stat. I then go for Hone Claws as I get hit by a super effective Fairy Wind, which doesn't actually do too much because of Eviolite. Now the only flaw with my strategy is that we have to use Iron Tail, which isn't very accurate, but luckily we can take out Weezing with a couple. That's why it's important that we went for Hone Claws, and Intimidate from Mawile nullifies my attack boost, but at least our accuracy is still good. And after knowing Opal's favorite color is purple, we get our defenses doubled, which means I can safely go for a Hone Claws and live on 2 HP after Drain and Kiss. Now at this point, we're in a really good position. We're at plus two speed, plus one attack. We take out Mawile, which means we get another Moxie boost. And the accuracy boost from Hone Claws means that we're gonna hit Iron Tail every single time. This means we can take out Togekiss reliably with a single Iron Tail and get a third attack boost with Moxie. And our victory is further guaranteed by the fact that we use Protect all those turns, which means we get the question as soon as Alcremi gets out. And so with that additional attack boost and the fact that we can't miss Iron Tail, we guarantee our victory against Opal and get our fifth gym badge. That was a lot easier than I expected it would be. And if we can keep up this pace, we might actually be able to complete the run. Oh yeah, speaking of running, Opal goes totally crazy about the fact that B dresses in pink. I hope that doesn't mean he's gonna start using fairy types. After this encounter, we arrive in Sir Chester, uh, Churchester, Chistershire, uh, the snowy one. Here I get stopped by a police officer for not being good enough at Nuzlocke's. Luckily though, it turns out that that's not a criminal offense, and after the battle, Bradford evolves into Grimmsnarl, and Skaroopy evolves into Drapion. Literal instance after that, I run into my next encounter, a Sneasel. Now I decide to name the Sneasel Cardiff just to represent wheels a bit. Yeah, I'm gonna stay away from that Welsh accent. Anyway, next up is Gordian as rock types, and he starts off the battle with Barbarkle, so I send in Crawdont. Knowing he's most likely gonna go for Shell Smash, I decide to set up on my own and go for Sword Stand since most of the other moves he has can't really touch me. That being said though, I take more than half from a Razor Shell after taking him down with my own Razor Shell. I thought Shuckle would be a two-shot with its massive defense, but it 
it too goes down to a razor shell. And for Stonejourner, I specifically relearned Bubble Beam since it has a mere 20 special defense, so it's gonna go down no problem. It's then time for Gordy's big bad boss Pokemon, Colossal, which is literally slow as dirt. So even though Derby's a really slow fish on land, we can just take it out with a boosted quad effective razor shell. Looks like Gordy just got rocked. Uh, yeah, I'll see myself out. But as soon as we've defeated the gym, we can take on Team Yell and help this doctor guy who ends up giving us the Rotom Bike, so now we can ride on water. And on my way to Spike Myth, I find the Scope Lens, which is going to be super useful for our Sniper Drapion. I can also pick up the Razor Claw in the wild area so that we can evolve Sneasel. And honestly, I'm not sure if this is a Pokemon gym or a gymnastics gym. It turns out the gym actually belongs to a Dark-type trainer that doesn't like Dynamax. Hold on. Anyway, Piers leads with Scrafty, so I start off with Sneasel just so that I can eat and intimidate. I then go ahead and swap out into Bradford who can very easily tank a brick break and start going for power-up punches. The only problem with this is that this Scrafty has sand attack and you guys know I hate accuracy strats. Fortunately for me though, I not only connect with my next power-up punch, but the following one as well. This means that Scrafty goes down and our next opponent is his ace Pokemon, Obstagoon. I manage to hit him with a spirit break, which takes him down to super low health. And the next turn, he goes for Obstruct, which harshly lowers my defense, and I see this as a sign from the RNG gods to switch into Plymouth. It can easily tank a Shadow Claw, and it has a little something I like to call Fell Stinger. If you take someone out with this really weak move, you end up getting a plus three to your attack. So now that we're at plus three and Malamar is quad weak to bug, we can just take it out with another Fell Stinger and get to plus six. And with our attack stat maxed out, it doesn't matter that Night Slash is resisted, we take home the seventh gym badge from Piers. In preparation for Raihan, I find out that the wild area is the only place where the day-night cycle works, so I manage to finally evolve Sneasel into Weavile. I also see that the Isle of Armor has foggy weather, so I run into a Zerua, which I catch a name London. And not long after being caught, London evolves into Zoroark. And this means that it's now time to face Raihan, a double battle that I'm very, very scared of. And here's the thing, his Flygon has Breaking Swipe, which hits both your Pokemon and lower their attack, so I have to get rid of it immediately with Weavile's Ice Shard. And I went ahead and picked up Dragon Dance from a max raid in the wild area for Manchester, but this means we're unfortunately gonna have to sack Weavile. Except for some odd reason that I can't understand, Gigalith goes for Stealth Rock instead of Body Press, so I guess Weavile lives. Next, he sends in Sandaconda, so I can go for the low kick on Gigalith, which doesn't kill, but that's perfect, because then I can kill it with a Brick Break and get the Moxie Boost on Scrafty. Sandaconda then hits me with a Glare, but I prepared for this situation by giving Scrafty a Cherry Berry. At this point, it's time for Big Boy Duraludon to come in, and I have have to bank on hitting a high jump kick, which is a 90% accurate move with Scrafty to be able to win this one. And fortunately I do, and I managed to take down Duraludon in a single hit. Oh my goodness, that thing could have caused me so much trouble otherwise. The next turn, Sandaconda hits my Weavile with a glare, so I switch out for Bradford and then hit it with a crunch, which isn't quite enough to take it out. But at this point, we're at no risk of losing the battle at least, and so I hit it with a fake out the next turn with Bradford, and a second crunch takes it out. And so at this point, we're eight badges in, and all we have to do is defeat the Pokemon League. I think we might be able to do this, guys. The big city of Winden is our next stop, and here we find our favorite person in the whole world, Ball Guy. Ball Guy then hands us the Dream Ball, but he doesn't understand that he's the real Dream Ball. And so it's finally time to take on the Pokemon League Challenge, and we have the semifinals to face off against Marnie. Now here's the thing about her lie part. It only has Fake Out and Snarl as its damaging moves, and Manchester quad resists Snarl, so I can very freely just set up six dragons dragon dances against this thing. This means that every single one of her Pokemon just gets absolutely one-shot by either Drain Punch or Thunder Punch. Even her Gigantamax Grimmsnarl just goes down to a single hit. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I find it kind of ironic that Marnie gets taken down by the most punk Pokemon of all time. It's then time to go up against Leon Minus, so he sends in Dubwool and I start out with Bradford. My strategy here was very simple. Just go for Priority Bulk Up since I have Prankster and hope to not get paralyzed by Dubwool. Once again, we find ourselves in a situation where the lead Pokemon can't really touch us us, so we can just freely set up on it for a sweep. We can then go ahead and take out Double with Drain Punch, which means we pretty much get all the health back that it took away from us. Pinkurchin, Corviknight, and Snorlax then just get absolutely one shot. So now we only have to contend with his Dynamax Inteleon, which hits us with a Max Geyser, but luckily we tank it pretty well, and obviously it just goes down to a Thunder Punch. These first couple Pokemon League battles were pretty much free for us, but I fear what's to come. Anyway, after humiliating Hop in front of the whole world, Piers decides to have a concert, which Ponyard really ends up liking and evolves into Bisharp. Our Pokemon League challenge is then interrupted by the fact that the chairman is evil, and we have to take on Angry Businesswoman, who starts off with Frostlass, so I start with Plymouth. 
After healing off a burn with my Rossberry, I go for agility to double my speed so I can outspeed everything on her team. However, Night Slash doesn't take her out the next turn, and luckily she doesn't go for will o -Wisp, but this is perfect. Since she's at such low health, we can just take her out with a Fell Stinger and get a plus three boost in attack. All that isn't enough to take out my Lodic though, but luckily she throws and goes for Aqua Ring, so a second Night Slash does the job. Salazzle obviously goes down to a quad effective Earthquake, and while Serena doesn't go down to one Fell Stinger, a second one does it and we get to plus six. This means we can take down G-Max Garboder with a single Earthquake and beat Angry Businesswoman. It's then time to go back to the Pokemon League where we get interrupted by Challenger Bead. He starts out with Mawile, which intimidates my Crocodile, which is actually perfect because I expect to not kill and I get him down to very low health. This means I can send in Plymouth, who absolutely tanks a crit play rough, and then go for the Fell Stinger and get my boost. Now that I'm at plus three attack, it's pretty much good game for Challenger Bead, since I can just go for cross poisons and take down his entire team, including its G-Max Pokemon. Listen, Bead, even though you evolved your Pokemon into fairy types, it's not enough to take out my dark types. So far, we've had a pretty good go of the Pokemon League, and next up is Nessa, so I decide to bring back leads. Now, Nessa starts with Galissapod, which has first impression, which is quad effect but after using Protect, it can't use it again, so I'm pretty much free to set up on this thing. It only has Shadow Claw and Liquidation, which are both moves that I resist, so I can just set up Growths until I'm happy. I go for a Leaf Blade, which Emergency exits out her Seeking, which goes down, and I can then Protect to dodge another First Impression. I then decide to go for another Growth, because like, why not? It's pretty much free, and I take it out with another Leaf Blade. Her next Pokemon is Pelipper, which is faster than me, so I go for Sucker Punch and take it out in one hit, and same goes for Barrascuda. And since Dreadnought's so slow, Low, it just goes down to a quad effective leaf blade. So that's it for Nessa, and we now have to go up against B once again and perhaps relive our nightmares. She starts out with Halucha, so I send in Bradford, who can go for priority bulk ups because of Prankster. She then actually misses her first high jump kick and takes out half her own health, so I can go for a second bulk up. After taking a few high jump kicks that actually hit me, I take it out with Thunder Punch. Her next Pokemon is Phalanx, which goes down to a few drain punches, and both Surfetched and Graplock get one shot by a play rough. Then we've got G-Max Machamp, and boy does it feel good to one-shot this thing with a play rough since it caused so much devastation to the team. And I'm very happy about the fact that we don't have to go up against any more Fighting-type trainers, but now we have to face Raihan and his dragons, this time in a single battle. Since Crocodile is pretty tanky, I decide to go for a bulk up, and I actually have to eat a Solar Beam, which is really powerful, but we end up living the hit. I don't know what this guy was thinking using a Torkoal, but it gets absolutely knocked out by an Earthquake, and so does pretty much everything else on Raihan's team. His Flygon goes for Sand Storm, and because of all the Moxie boosts, I can just take it down with a Crunch. And sitting at plus four, we can easily one-shot G-Max Duraludon. And now we only have to face the champion, except for the fact that the chairman decides he wants to ruin the world with gigantic Pokemon, which is a pretty cool plan to be fair, but we gotta stop him. But here's the thing, we've got the unstoppable Dragon Dancing Manchester on our team, and Megahorn doesn't quite do enough to take us out. So the rest of Rose's team gets absolutely clapped since we get Moxie boosts every single time, and even Kaparaja can't stand up to Manchester. But the chairman just golf claps and says that Doomsday's still on, so we gotta deal with that. So we summon the legendary puppies, you know, the good one and the chunky one. And I gotta say, Behemoth Blade is a pretty awesome animation. And at this point, the game forces us to capture Eternatus, so I decide to make Ball Guy proud, and I catch it in the Dream Ball. It's now finally time, the final battle is upon us, and we challenge Leon for the champion title. Leon actually has a terrifying lineup, and I had to forge a very intricate strategy to even consider being able to beat this one. Anyway, I start the battle by using Stealth Rock with Glasgow, and I then have to take a four times effective Sacred Sword, but I end up living because of my Focus Sash. The next turn, I can take out Aegislash with a Night Slash since it only has base 50 defense in attack stance. Unfortunately, this means that Glasgow has to go down against Seismitoad. You may take his life. You'll never take his freedom. Next up, I send in Bradford and go for priority bulk up once again as he hits me with a Toxic, which I can heal off with a Pecha Berry. Honestly though, even if Seismitoad would have gone for two Earthquakes, it wouldn't have taken me out, so I would have been fine either way to set up, and I can just go ahead and take it out with a Power Whip, which is a TR I found in a Raid Den. Now, it actually ends up being super important that he didn't hit me with two Earthquakes, because Leon's next Pokemon is Haxorus. And my plan here was actually to let Bradford go down, but it ends up living in Iron Tail, so I can just take it out with a Spirit Break. This actually 
actually puts me in a fantastic position, because even though I have to go down to an acrobatics from Cinderace, I get a free switch into Exeter. Now, I have no idea why Cinderace goes for acrobatics here, but I would have lived a Pyro Ball either way, and I can take it down with a single Earthquake and get myself a Moxie Boost. This Moxie Boost is actually really clutch, since I wanted to have an Assault Vest on Exeter, which means I can't use Bulk Up. However, Assault Vest reduces any special damage I take, and this Dragapult basically can't touch me, so I'm free to take it out with a Crunch. And so even though we've sustained two casualties so far, we have to go up against Charizard, which actually takes half damage from the Stealth Rocks I set up the first turn. And it's at this point that Leon Gigantamax is his Charizard, and I expected him to go for a Dynamax Grass move against Exeter, so I switch into Manchester. However, curiously enough, he actually goes for G-Max Rockfall, which isn't effective either, and it sets up the Sandstorm, so it's gonna chip some damage off of him. The next turn I go for Protect, as he goes for G-Max Wildfire, which really doesn't do any damage at all, but now I'm trapped in. Since I know I'm probably going to go down to a G-Max Airstream, I decide to go for Double Protect and I actually get it, as he goes for G-Max Airstream and takes me out anyway. You know, Leon's actually kind of a cool guy for admitting that his crit mattered. But this means that Manchester goes down, who's been an absolute MVP. Either way, it's going to be Wakefield's time to shine, as Leon's Dynamax turns wear out and we can take down Charizard with an Aqua Jet, since we already had a bunch of damage on it. And so that means we did it! We're the champions of the Gala region, and more importantly, we managed to beat Pokemon Sword using only Dark types. And look, we lost 9 Pokemon along the way, which I think is actually more deaths than in all my other Nuzlocks combined. But in the end, we pulled through and we got to use some awesome Pokemon and some even more awesome strategies. And listen, if you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like because it really helps me out. And hey, if you watch content like this on YouTube, feel free to subscribe. I mean, like 99% of my viewers aren't subscribed. Am I that bad? Come on, leave me a sub. And don't forget that if you want to see Nuzlocke content live over on Twitter, which make sure to follow me at Antlerboy Live. I'm currently doing a bug only Nuzlocke of Black and White 2 over there. And finally, feel free to leave your suggestions down in the comments below of runs you want to see in the future. And until we see each other next time, cheerio, chaps!